I have a guest today who you will recognize uh, from Newsmax. I hope you've read uh, his column uh, in Town Hall. Uh, this guy has been everywhere. He's done it all, seen it all. And uh, we are so grateful that he carved out a little bit of time this morning to spend with us. John Nance, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me. So um, first and foremost, I always have to ask any guest who is in law enforcement, why did you become a cop, John? Well, um, my parents were both deaf. So I grew up in a deaf household. And, and so because of that, I was always having to take care of them and assist them with different things. And I think that's where that desire to help people, defend people, be of service. I think that's, that's where that impetus came from, my my childhood. So that's that's really how I saw law enforcement as an opportunity to help people that can't that, that, that couldn't help themselves. I love that. So you uh, had a very storied career with the FBI. Talk about that for a couple of minutes. Well, uh, my first assignment was uh, to the Miami field office after graduating from Quantico. Actually, before that, I was a Greenville County deputy sheriff for about six years. But uh, my first assignment was Miami, and I was assigned to a counterintelligence squad, which is what I wanted to do because I'd been in local law enforcement for a while and I wanted something different. And the counterintelligence um, squad was something very, very different. Uh, very paperwork driven. Not every, it's not really suitable for everybody. I know a lot of people, especially that come from law enforcement, they don't feel like it's action packed enough, kind of a cerebral sort of endeavor, but I really enjoyed it. Did that work for about three and a half years. Um, uh, tried out for Miami SWAT, got on the SWAT team, uh, did some deployments to Haiti. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting job that was for sure. Uh, from there, I went on to ground surveillance with the uh, Special Operations Group. Um, I did that for about three years and then took a transfer to the Attorney General's protection detail out of uh, the Washington field office. So when Eric Holder was the Attorney General, uh, I was assigned to his protection detail for three and a half years. And that was a fascinating assignment. Went places I never would have gone saw people I never would have seen. Really, really interesting work. After that, um, I stayed at WFO, Washington Field Office, uh, went back to surveillance, ended up uh, supervising the ground surveillance squad. And then the last part of my career, the last three years of my career, uh, I, I moved over to the aviation side of the house and supervised the surveillance aviation component of Washington Field Office. Now, let me ask you something is pe people uh, always make comments about law enforcement and how political it has become. Mm -hmm. You su supervised people and you protected people on both sides, or should I say all sides of the political spectrum. Did your That's politics true. play a part, John? Uh, in terms of dignitary protection, absolutely not. Now, um, I didn't agree with Eric Holder's politics, but I respected the office. And in fact, Eric Holder as a person, you uh, you couldn't have asked for a better person to work for. He was very polite, <clears throat> always very appreciative of what we did. And I tell you, the proof in the pudding is uh, uh, people's children often. And his kids were just as polite, just as respectful. So complete opposite side of the political spectrum for me but that had absolutely nothing to do with how we conducted ourselves, how we protected him, uh, our motivations to do so had nothing to do with any of that. And that's how it should be, right? In federal law enforcement, as well as in state or local law enforcement. I have had to protect um, people during protests and demonstrations. I absolutely abhorred what they stood for. And yet I knew that they deserved to be able to express their own views. So does it frustrate you now to see how uh, federal law enforcement um, has become such a political football? 
Absolutely. Well, a lot of the problems that we're seeing, I think, stem from the DEI policies that have come out of the Biden White House. So decisions are being made not with operational requirements in mind, but with political mandates in mind. So we're that's that's why we're seeing problems with capability. I think that's why we're seeing problems with, uh, you know, in particular with Trump's d detail, at least at least as far as the first uh, assassination attempt. And it's really shocking to have to talk about two assassination attempts. But um, the weaponization issue, the the anti-law enforcement um, atmosphere that we find ourselves in, all of this stuff contributes to what we're seeing today. In fact, we know that the shooter from the, the most recent Trump uh, assassination attempt uh, had a very long criminal history. And within the last couple of years, uh, John Lott, who is a, a really uh, fantastic um, mind and, and analytical, statistical uh, person, um, over the last two years, he's seen the arrest rates drop by 50%. So this anti-law enforcement atmosphere that's also expressed in the lack of prosecutions results in people like this disturbed individual falling through the cracks, not being appropriately adjudicated and, and dealt with by our, uh, um, our judicial system, uh, end up in the position to, you know, potentially try to assassinate a former president. So it's very disturbing to see the weaponization of the federal government uh, elections have consequences, uh, like like uh, people hear quite a bit. So you put people in power that are not that are not in, that that do not support law enforcement, and that put politics over people's safety, and you end up in in a position like this with very dangerous and potentially lethal consequences. Doctor Lott has been a guest on this show, and we we uh -huh. absolutely adore him and and he has been doing decades of research he very famously wrote a book called more guns less crime right. uh and and he was immediately excoriated for that and and we have seen over the years since he wrote that book he continues to do incredible research that indeed uh his original premise is true in areas where you have uh more citizens properly and legally armed you do tend to have less crime and yet we are in this not just anti-police but this atmosphere of deprosecution and decarceration mm -hmm. and and it it so negatively impacts not just law enforcement and not just the criminal justice system but our citizens as well doesn't it john yeah, and the proposition that an armed society is a polite society, I mean, it's born it's borne out by the statistics. And anybody that wants to can go to Lot's website and see all the data for themselves. And uh, it really is common sense. I mean, where does a criminal go? A criminal is going to go where he or she does not feel like they're going to meet much or any resistance. So if that is a gun-free zone, then you have criminals that are drawn to gun-free zones. That's in part why we see problems with our with our school systems, because they have become gun free zones. I know that the school resource officer initiative is becoming uh, more widespread, and I think that is a very good thing. Uh, in fact, the last school shooting that we saw uh, involved uh, a, re a school resource officer who confronted that 14 year old, and when uh, and when he did so. Uh, the the individual surrendered, which is usually what happens in an active shooter situation. You confront the active shooter, they either take their own life or they surrender. That's typically statistically what happens. So it reinforces the idea of it takes a good guy with a gun to stop a bad guy with a gun. You know, John, I can't go to my county board of supervisors meeting without going through a metal detector and uh, being wanded by an armed deputy. Um, you can't go before a judge when you get a traffic ticket without going through a metal detector and having armed security right there protecting that judge. 
Why do you think we are so hesitant as a country to provide that same kind of security for our school children? Well, it's become politicized. And, the, you know, a gun essentially is a tool of power. And if you have a government that is tilting towards totalitarianism, they don't want those tools of power available to everyone. Because quite frankly, in order to accomplish your, your collectivist goals, your statist goals, you have to have the power, the physical power to do that. So if the people are armed, then that thwarts that capability, or at least it instills the, the fear of that in, in politicians who might seek that kind of radical power. So I don't really, I mean, the reason why we're not protecting our schools, I think is inexcusable. There's no reason why you can't, and some schools do have metal detectors, things of that nature. Uh, but, and I think the school resource program is a, a fantastic idea, has been for many, many years. Strengthening that is a, is a, 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 a big step forward in the right direction. Uh, I think that arming qualified um, school employees, I think that is a good idea as well. Uh, frankly, you know, if if you have politicians or individuals that do not trust the citizens to be armed, then I think that speaks more to their potential intention as as a politician than it does than it does anything else. You know, absolutely, and we we often see now that someone, you know, a citizen who uses a firearm or another weapon. Uh, in a manner of self-defense is often arrested and prosecuted. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and conversely, we hear a lot of rhetoric, you know, from the left, from activists who want more gun laws, more gun control, if you will. But yet when, when uh, every day in this country, when armed robbers and gangbangers and, and drug dealers are arrested with firearms, they seem to be out before the uh, street cop finishes the paperwork. Talk right. about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about our biggest metropolitan centers like Chicago, New York, Detroit. These are all, these are all highly restrictive. Washington, DC, for instance, these are all high re highly restrictive areas in terms of, of gun ownership, uh, very gun controlled areas. And these are some of the areas that, that experience some of our highest crime rates some of our highest violent crime rates. So it it um, it is not proving the argument that, you know, guns or quote unquote gun violence is the problem. It's, you know, it's, I can't remember what movie it's from, but it's, it's I think it's a Clint Eastwood movie, maybe. Uh, essentially, the, it's the evil heart that kills. It's, it's not the tool. And in fact, when you remove guns, you see that people pick up other tools, you know, whether it's a knife or a baseball bat or whatever it may be. So um, it's a it's a it's a thorny problem. And I don't think we have the political will to actually deal with this issue uh, because it's a combination of a law and order emphasis with allowing the people to exercise their constitutional right to keep and bear arms. You know, you were both a street cop and then a federal agent. And when you look at this, the war on cops that we're dealing with, which is really uh, has been going on for about 10 years, but especially for the last four years, we have seen not just physical attacks on law enforcement officers, but also the political attacks on the entire profession. I know you do some writing on this. Um, what are your thoughts on where we're headed with all of that in 2024? Hmm. Well, I, I think as long as, oh, take the FBI, for instance, as long as the FBI is useful to the left, then they'll continue to support um, what the FBI is doing in terms of some of the weaponization and, and the, politi the, the politicization that the Bureau has been involved in recently. Now, when the BLM and Antifa riots were happening, 
the left was attacking uh, local law enforcement because, you know, they're symbols of law and order and they weren't politically useful. I think that if we continue to see this domination of the of the political left in our society, in our politics in particular, we're going to see more and more of this anti-law enforcement rhetoric, uh, especially directed toward local law enforcement. Uh, if, you know, God forbid, you know, we, we have another, if we, we have four years of Harris, uh, we're going to see increasing politicization of agencies like the FBI, uh, continued problems at the Secret Service. At the heart of a lot of this, like I mentioned before, are DEI policies that, that don't emphasize merit but uh, emphasize decision-making based on politically driven metrics, which is absolute poison for, for any uh, federal agency, state agency that, um, that, that may be dealing with that, with those policies. So going forward, uh, if we have a Trump administration, I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm advocating for. Uh, we'll see a, a, a renewed respect for law enforcement at, at all levels. And, I think Trump will do what Roosevelt did back in the 1920s. In fact, the Bureau at that time was in a real mess like it is today. In fact, the Bureau back then was known as the Bureau of, of Investigation. And it essentially didn't have any hiring practices. So you had literally criminals carrying a Bureau of Investigation badge. So Roosevelt recognized that problem. He brought in an attorney general, uh, um, Stone was his last name, Harlan Stone in the 1920s, and he gave him a mandate to clean up the FBI. And the first thing that Harlan Stone did was appoint J. Edgar Hoover as the director. Now, like him, hate him, whatever you want to say about him, he radically transformed the FBI and kind of turned it into the better parts of what we know the FBI today. So there's historical precedents for that. If we can, if we can get Trump into the White House, in my personal opinion, uh, this next election cycle, then we can see an attorney general with a mandate to reform, an FBI director with a mandate to reform, and hopefully a a a reformed FBI, the 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 kind of FBI that America deserves, not not what it has. Well. And of course, the National Police Association, we don't get involved in uh, in the candidates. But I I'm sure. curious as to what you think about because you have been a supervisory special agent. You worked in Washington, D.C. There are some who say that federal law enforcement and especially uh, the FBI needs to be taken out of Washington, needs to be decentralized, needs the headquarters to be uh, somewhere else. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think the physical location is so much of an issue. I think decentralizing for sure in terms of pulling people out of headquarters. I think headquarters has become a behemoth. Investigations should be run at the field office level. That is another huge problem with how investigations are run uh, at the FBI. Uh, the whole reason why we're, we dealt with Russiagate is because that investigation was was conducted out of headquarters. Uh, the Hillary Clinton uh, classified information investigation, that was all run out of headquarters. Um, I personally, extremely disappointed. I was very disappointed to watch uh, Director Comey essentially exonerate Hillary Clinton on national TV for doing things that as an FBI agent, if I had done those things, I would have been, my security clearance would have been immediately suspended probably would have been fired and 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 most likely become the subject of a counterintelligence investigation. So I, I got to switch gears because I only have about three minutes left. How did you start writing for Town Hall? Because people really need to follow your articles. Your, your articles are, they're well-written, of course, but uh, they're incredibly diverse and they're very thought-provoking. Every time I read something you've written, I look up five other things that I get interested in. Talk about how that started. My wife and I used to attend CPAC quite a bit. And we got to know Katie Pavlich way back in the day. And in fact, when she was writing her first book, uh, Fast and Furious, 
I was assigned to the attorney general's protection detail at that time. So we we had that sort of common interest. And when we met at CPAC, we, we talked about that for a bit. And then I reached out to her later with a writing sample, and she was gracious enough to to allow me to start writing uh, at Town Hall. So that was that's kind of how that happened. Town Hall is a great organization, uh, in my opinion, not that I would be biased, but uh, some of the best in conservative news and opinion that um, that's currently available. So uh, I really enjoy writing for them. They've been really good to me. And uh, I do like to address a variety of topics. I don't like to just talk about bureau stuff. And uh, I try to call out the bureau when it does the wrong thing. And I try to give credit where credit is due when the bureau uh, does the right thing. And they're still, <laughs> they're harder to find these days, but there still are examples of the bureau doing the right thing. And by the way, let me just say, there are a lot of good men and women at the FBI, brick agents doing the job uh, day in and day out. They, they absolutely are I'm risking their lives doing it. And I have to brag Arizona's own Katie Pavlich, by the way. Um, right. <laughs> we're very, we're very proud of her uh, right. here in Arizona and all the, all the hard work that she does. John, where can people find your column? Where can they find you, uh, your social media? Give, give all of it to us. Well, you can find me at uh, townhall.com, but actually the best place to find uh, my stuff is uh, X. I'm on X, uh, Instagram, Facebook, True Social, all of it at the John Nance doc, uh, or at the John Nance. Absolutely. And I, I really, I recommend that, that everybody absolutely follows you. John, I can't thank enough for spending time with us today. And uh, I'll see you soon on Newsmax. And if you'd like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Join the National Police Association in supporting our brave men and women in blue. Every day they put their lives on the line to keep us safe. But they need our help to continue their mission. Black Lives Matter, Antifa, progressive prosecutors, and the rest of the anti-police forces receive millions in donations from extremists like George Soros and woke companies like Amazon, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, and Google, to name a few. The National Police Association is fighting them in courts around the country including the United States Supreme Court, defending officers who are being attacked for doing their jobs. Additionally, the National Police Association works year-round to pass tough-on-crime legislation to put and keep criminals behind bars. Consider going to nationalpolice.org and donating just $5 to keep us in the fight. Together, we can win. That is National